Hello. So uh, apologies for the the scheduling. It's uh, Sumit was meant to initially give the presentation, but he actually had to to leave. So you're you're with me now. Um, so what do we have here? Uh, we're, so we're in Atera, and we're a semiconductor company based in the Netherlands, and we're producing processors for Edge AI. Um, and I'm going to talk about how you can um, not care that we are spiking. So you didn't hear that word. That word. So we're um, the, the outline of the talk is, is as follows: just a bit of introduction on what Natera is and who we are uh, and what we do uh, about our product, the spiking neural processor. And then I'm going to show you how, uh, why it doesn't matter that we're spiking and how you do a bit of training and deployment uh, for this kind of a processor. Uh, finally, we'll conclude with a, with a demo of an always on uh, audio scene classifier um, just to, to get the ball rolling in so you can understand the kind of applications that you can put on here, but the chip generally isn't just meant for audio, it's sensor agnostic. So um, we are, as I was saying, a semiconductor company based in Delft in the Netherlands. Uh, it's a spin-off of TU Delft, um, and we're uh, venture capital backed, uh, with around 57 employees at the moment, uh, based uh, both in the Netherlands and in India, where we do our um, full stack development from algorithms to uh, SDK firmware, uh, all of the hardware that needs doing, as well as uh, testing, verification, validation. Um, the goal for us is to produce ultra low power uh, sensors for edge intelligence. Um, uh, yes, ultra low power intelligence for sensors. That's the, that's the key. Um, so where we position ourselves is somewhere very close to the sensors, but this is the general um, value chain where you could see from, from sensors which operate generally on less than a milliwatt or a milliwatt range, obviously depending on the sensors. Like we've seen earlier, some of the radar uh, sensors can operate in hundreds of milliwatts, but we generally try to stick to this kind of a budget. And then in the one to 10 milliwatts where you have um, some bit of processing um, where you would use an embedded uh, MCU to condition your data or get some basic understanding uh, of the data and what it's doing. This is maybe where you would position um, some of the very small neural networks or just some uh, AI, meaning uh, random forests or, or just some decision trees. Um, and going further up in the energy budgets, you would find more complex systems going all the way up to uh, data centers where you uh, would gain a lot of insight from your data, but you would also burn a lot of power and you would also have a lot of latency in producing any actionable result. Um, so we tend to stick to uh, the sensor edge where we're sort of defining these as being the constraints. So instead of going with the general constraint of uh, edge is uh, everything below the, below the server, we're saying edge is uh, the area where you have an average power constraint of around a milliwatt or less. Uh, you are code constrained, you don't have a lot of memory on chip. Um, you're also a latency constraint in the kind of uh, time you can let a user or customer wait for an action. Uh, and you're also bill of materials constrained. And that's where, you, that's where we believe we add value uh, at this kind of range. And so the spiking neural processor is a chip that has um, interfaces for uh, different types of sensors. Uh, here we include uh, radar microphones, but uh, it's also possible to include other sensor modalities, including ECG. Um, sensors that produce real-time data. So you notice that we're not really focusing on vision, but technically this isn't uh, really a constraint here. But uh, sensors produce real-time um, data that gets into the spiking neural processing processor to extract something out of it, either detect patterns or be able to do some um, feature extraction that, that gets sent on um, to a, a different unit that would integrate this kind of intelligence at a larger scale. So this is meant for always on sensing applications where um, you have millisecond level latency demands uh, and you're very power constrained where you want to be at the milli, uh, milliwatt or less than milliwatt um, peak power. A 
bit of introduction to spiking neural networks, as I'm assuming um, it, it, they're a relatively, they're not a new field, it's just that they're relatively uh, underexplored. Um, in, in the spiking neural network, you take your input data as you normally would, but then you would have to produce an additional step in the middle called encoding, because these spiking neural networks uh, differ from regular neural networks in that their inputs and their outputs are binary events in time sparse binary events. Um, so after the encoding step, uh, whichever flavor you desire uh, for your data, that the best suits your data, you would pass it through uh, this interconnected web of uh, neurons and synapses that have an internal uh, memory, a temporal memory, uh, let's call it a trace, where previous events are, let's say, remembered by the neurons um, and through the accumulation of incoming events through a set of weights, uh, the neurons can also produce an output activation through some thresholding. So inputs are sparse events, outputs are sparse events. Um, then you can produce from the outputs of your network, you can decode what the result is through a number of different ways. Um, here we have an example of simply counting the number of events and basically saying, the class that produced the most events is the class that has been is predicted by the network. Then you can make, take an action. Um, this isn't the, the, simplest, uh, the simplest example of a spiking neural network and how you would use it. Um, we're claiming that uh, because these neurons have a temporal component, a bit of memory on, based on the, the inputs that they get, that they essentially could be um, analogous to, let's say, a self-recurrent uh, self neural network, meaning uh, additional computational ability from these neurons. Therefore, we can afford to go with um, smaller, uh, uh, fewer neurons, fewer units on chip, and we claim around 100x reduction in the number of units that you would need to implement a similar uh, neural network. Um, in terms of interfaces where we position ourselves, uh, generally speaking, we have uh, standard digital interfaces at the input for ease of integration in uh, systems. So SPI, PDM, i squared desks, um, uh, in GPIOs. We also have some more exotic um, connectivity types that don't, uh, that, that are for, for sensors or that are event-based, but those are not uh, the large majority of sensors right now, although we predict that might, this might change in the future. Um, after the, the data is captured through, from these uh, standard interfaces, we obviously also have an on-chip uh, MCU, um, which is mainly responsible for uh, data acquisition and for any sort of relatively low levels of pre-processing that you may need to do. Um, this provides a lot of flexibility for the kinds of applications that you can run because generally speaking, this uh, CPU would be uh, quiescent, it would be asleep most of the time uh, because the main bulk of the computation would be taken care of by the analog spiking neuron uh, and synapse array. Um, so that is the component that accelerates the, the SNN computation. Um, so. This is a programmable uh, set of uh, multi-core um, crossbar arrays that, that can scale up and down. We can scale up and down depending on the demand of the, of the end user application. Um, and these basically allow for highly customizable uh, spiking neural network topologies to suit uh, the application needs. Um, and it is a standalone processor. It, it should be sufficient for, uh, it's the only sensor, the only chip that the sensor would need to make a local uh, action on the edge. For this, as I was promising earlier, um, the, it, it, we can't have an exotic way of programming such a chip. Uh, and we've opted for uh, PyTorch as the front end for such a system. Um, so a company uh, integrating uh, the SMP would uh, still require uh, a machine learning engineer, um, but not a machine learning engineer versed in spiking neural networks. So the, the workflow here would be to create uh, your model in, um, Py in Python, in PyTorch, in, in the normal way. 
uh, and provided uh, training data, and uh, then our SDK handles the, the rest of the computation, the, compila the compilation of the model after it's trained so that it can be deployed to hardware, while also providing uh, feedback on the quality of training and uh, allowing for um, any optimizations and bu building in optimizations so that the, the deployment to the chip is optimal. Uh, the error between uh, the PyTorch model natively to deployment uh, to the, the chip, um, the error is minimized. Um, and so this, this is a simple and easy to use uh, interface and um, ob obviously bu building on PyTorch is um, standard and, and fast, allowing for um, different platforms to be used as uh, the underlying targets for the optimization. Um, in terms of components that of our uh, tool chain, which is called Talamo, <coughs> um, it includes um, everything that you would need to build and train your models. Um, it's essentially identical to the PyTorch API, uh, so again, easy to use and uh, adopt, uh, but, and critically requires no knowledge of spiking neural networks. Um, uh, everything is covered here from data loading to the most exotic bits would essentially be the spiking conversions, but we provide reference implementations of these encoders and decoders uh, with, of course, the ability, because it's uh, PyTorch and Python, the ability to extend uh, these components so that um, a new application could have a um, dedicated encoder or decoder that best, best suits that particular application. Uh, functionally speaking, uh, the training, uh, quantization aware training um, uh, is enabled here as well, um, and the addition of um, surrogate gradients for spikes means uh, it's easy, it, it's generally easy to, to train such a network. Um, I also have a demo uh, video of this happening, but uh, I expect that most folk would like to also enjoy lunch. Um, so generally speaking, the, the programming model involves the creation of a, of a neural network and just setting up um, the staging, let's say, where you're deciding, uh, where you're taking your data and at least initializing uh, an untrained, a previously untrained network. Um, and deciding uh, then on your hyperparameters. Uh, and then, as usual, you would proceed to the training phase, uh, which is essentially a one-liner, uh, one function call that uh, starts taking your data, encodes it into spikes, runs the feed forward and the, the backward pass uh, through your network, uh, accumulates all of the evidence of uh, the spikes and where they've flown through the network to update the, the weights of the network. Um, and this, although the example is built using MNIST, this kind of flow works for any sort of data set that um, you may have. Um, and so this is the general flow. Um, you, you train it, you execute it in, in, in PyTorch, uh, as well as our own hardware-aware uh, simulator that, uh, because the platform is analog mixed signal, we also have a very highly accurate uh, simulation platform that captures the salient features of the analog mixed signal platform so that when you train with that information, uh, when the optimizer has access to the information of what the chip is like, um, then it, it further minimizes the error between the, the network uh, trained purely in PyTorch and uh, at, for deployment. So here we also have a, an, an example, as I promised, of uh, this in action. Um, it's an example of an always-on audio scene classification, for example, for hearables. Um, and we have a couple of scenes that we're trying to classify so the audio data is captured and sent to the SNP so that it can classify the particular scene as uh, uh, airport or car park or um, a few other examples. And as an example for, for you to be able to then say, uh, take an action. So the proposed action here would be changing a few filter banks to uh, the, the equalizer, for example, to better uh, suit that kind of environment. The general pipeline um, is something like this, so relatively easy and straightforward. Uh, 
uh, the pre-processing involves uh, some uh, co computation of male frequency uh, coefficients, uh, an encoding that's relatively simple, uh, then pass to a small SNN to then uh, produce a classification. Um, and it looks something like this. Uh, these are the headline numbers, I'd say, for, for this kind of an application. Uh, we also have a, a, this demo running at our booth um, if you want to try it out yourself. Uh, but in short, it consumes uh, around one milliwatt uh, of peak power. Uh, with an accuracy of about 85% on this uh, subset of the DK's challenge. Um, as in, in essence, uh, the, the audio stream is, is cut into um, uh, one second chunks and then fed to the, the SNN for inference. And um, it, it takes us around it takes us around one millisecond to produce an inference for each uh, a sample of one second of audio while fitting in a model size of around three kilobytes. Um, so in short, as it seems I'm on time, uh, the AGI is generally uh, power latency, code size, and bill of materials constraints. And what we're showing here is um, the, the hardware, the software, being able to implement a uh, audio scene classifier in a power budget that fit, fits this demand. Um, and with an SDK that is easy to use, uh, that enables quick adoption and quick training of networks. Um, and we would say that um, likely the, the future of TinyML is neuromorphic, is what we would claim and we would hope. So in short, that's it. Thank you very much.